In this segment, um, I'm going to talk about the economics of privacy, and in particular, the behavioural economics. Now, you'll remember that network effects lead to monopolies in information markets and in markets for goods and services that have got an information component. And you'll remember also that an efficient monopolist is a discriminating one. So monopolies often have a very strong incentive to price discriminate, and we've seen examples. Now, as more and more goods get an information component, we're going to get more and more discrimination. But at the same time, the information that modern technology produces gives the means to discriminate. So many things that we used to do offline are now done online, and we hand over our information in return for these services. And this means that technology is creating both the motive and the means for, create, for collecting personal data at the same time. That's the fundamental problem here. So this is actually changing the nature of privacy. Now privacy goes way, way back in human history, but it first started to be formulated by legal scholars in the late 19th century, when Warren and Brandeis, in a famous dissenting judgment, defined it as the right to be left alone. A few years later, there was the Abigail Robertson case, the Franklin Mills flower girl. Uh, she was a young lady whose image was used without her consent on 25,000 advertising handbills put out by a local flower mill to her great embarrassment. And so she sued the flower mill, and although she lost, she got so much sympathy that uh, the first law was brought in, which gave people in America the right to exploit their image for commercial purposes, which is one of the foundations of Hollywood and many other uh, information industries. And later editions included um, wrongs, torts, for the disclosure of intimate facts and for putting people in a false light. In the European Union, meanwhile, um, there was a movement to bring in data protection based on informational self-determination. That is the idea that you should know who had information about you and you should have the right to inspect it and change it if it's wrong. But on top of this um, structure that we had by the 1960s, we now have got a, a further privacy concern, which is how do we prevent consumers being exploited by the monopolies that are arising everywhere and are using information in order to discriminate. So <coughs> the next thing that we, we might ask is whether markets might fix privacy, because there's several markets involved here. There's the market for personal information, the many markets in which our facts and um, stuff get traded, and then of course there are markets for privacy. Now, the first problem with this is, and this was realised by the 1980s, is that if you're a good debtor, if you always pay your bills, then it's in your interest to advertise this fact. Whereas if somebody else is a bad debtor and has been bankrupt, you'll try and hide it. And if all the people who are good debtors publish this fact, then the bankrupts have got no place to hide. And so you end up with credit reference agencies having information on essentially everybody. Some countries allow you to hide your credit reference file, but if you do that, then you can't, of course, get credit. And so there's an interesting mixture of externality here and adverse selection. And there's all sorts of other outcomes possible with such markets. In the UK, for example, many professions require criminal records background checks, uh, which mean that people who have had some conviction when they were young may be herded into an ever smaller number of professions. And it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. The second problem, uh, which was something that emerged during the 90s at the beginning of the dot-com boom, is that ideally I want firms to know what things I want to buy and what not to buy so that people don't bother me with spam and marketing calls for things I'm never going to purchase. But I don't want firms to know how much I want these things or I'm going to get ripped off. If they know that I really, really want something, they'll charge me everything that I've got for it. And it's very, very difficult to define the right sort of property rights for markets to be able to work. A third problem is that as we've moved from a world of merely annoying marketing phone calls to um, information services everywhere online driven by advertising and collecting our data, then the intrusions become invisible and ubiquitous. When you hand over your information to get some um, service online, you have no idea how or how long your information is going to be used. Now, in the European Union, we try to fix this with data protection law, which entitles me, in theory, to find out who's got information on me and to correct it if it's wrong. But in the modern world, the transaction costs of doing that are so high 
um, that this way of working is no longer really operational in practice. And the EU's debt of protection law is um, right now um, being reconsidered by the European Parliament and Commission. But the failure of privacy markets doesn't just harm consumers, it also harms companies. Until the mid-1990s, email was a useful commercial marketing tool, but then so many firms spoiled it by sending spam that now it's almost useless. We find that there are millions of people who avoid online shopping and banking, which imposes huge costs on shops and banks, and that they have to hire staff to do transactions that could be easily done online. And many people will abandon shopping baskets at websites as they're about to check out and as the website asks them more questions than they're comfortable with. In America alone, this is over $10 billion in lost sales every year. And finally, there have been some businesses have been trashed by spam and abuse. An example was MySpace, which um, was overtaken by Facebook because MySpace users came to the conclusion that it was becoming a bit like a bad part of town. So what's the upshot from the consumer's point of view? Well, um, attitudes are fairly stable, but they're surprising. If you'd asked um, a bunch of people at any time since the 1960s in the English-speaking world whether they cared about privacy or not, about a third will say they don't care, uh, a third will say, well, we'll trade some information for some services, and a third will say that, yeah, they really care a lot and they're not going to tell you anything about them. But when you watch how people behave online, the great majority of them will trade really sensitive information for quite trivial benefits. In other words, there's a big gap between what we say and what we do. And this is one of the things that firms exploit. So where does this gap come from? Well, this is where behavioural factors come in. One of the factors is hyperbolic discounting. The fact that um, people don't really worry about tomorrow much, especially when future threats are a bit vague. Um, although economic models assume that we're rational, and that would mean that if you know, the interest rate is 5%, then a privacy harm costing us $100 in a year's time should be the same as a privacy harm that costs us $95 today. In practice, people ignore risks in the future, especially where these risks are uncertain, whether they don't know if the harm will be $100 or $10 or $1,000, and they don't know whether the risk of it happening is large or small. It all becomes too difficult and people just shrug it off. Second factor is that people like the illusion of control. Most people are more scared of flying than driving, even although flying is many times safer. Um, the fact that you've got the steering wheel in your hand gives you a feeling of comfort. And exactly the same thing happens with information. If you give people an opt-out button, a no publicity button at the bottom of your website that you can press, then only a small number will press it. Consistently somewhere between 1% and 2% in people in Britain, for example, have opted out of um, secondary use of medical records, despite the fact that you know, your medical records can end up being shared with an awful lot of companies and researchers around the world. So when you fail to press the opt-out button, you're exercising what you think is control, and you're not stopping to think that other people now acquire some control over your information too, because these people are remote, they're in the future, it's all uncertain, you don't know what's going to happen, and so it's easy to ignore it. Now, the fact that people like to ignore risks is brought out particularly well by an experiment that Alessandro Acquisti and colleagues did at um, CMU. And they were interested in the effect of making privacy salient. So they got um, three groups of students, and the first group of students were asked a series of embarrassing questions to see how many they would answer before they stopped, before they balked. Questions like, have you ever smoked dope? Have you ever cheated on a girlfriend? Have you ever cheated on an exam? And so on. So the control group answered a certain number of questions. And then the second group were given strong assurances about privacy. You know, we won't identify you. We won't keep a record of your IP address. We will encrypt your answers and so on and so forth. If people were rational, you'd think that these students would volunteer more information because it was going to be protected better. But in fact, they volunteered very, very little information because privacy had been made salient to them. They'd started thinking about it, which the first group hadn't really. And then in the third group, they were put in an online environment 
that was fun and games. They were taken to a website, howbadareyou.com, of a little devil with red horns and a tail saying, go on, show us how bad you are. And of course, they just answered all the questions. All right. And this is a lesson that is well learned uh, by people like social networking sites because they go out of their way to make their websites fun and games and they do not put the privacy policy on the front page. So go on, how bad are you? Show us how bad you are. Is the psychological context that is quite deliberately said by many websites nowadays in order to make us eager to share our personal information. In summary, privacy is eroded by multiple market failures of a classic economic type, including network effects and asymmetric information, but it's also eroded by behavioral factors, which include inconsistent risk preferences over time and context, of which salience is especially important and is especially easy for websites to manipulate.